All right, we're going to bring out our next panel. Uh, this is our panel of leaders of historically black colleges and universities. Uh, and so I will introduce our panelists. We will have Michael Sorrell, the president of Pat Quinn College, David Thomas, president of Morehouse College, who will be joining us uh, via Zoom, uh, and Walter Kimbrough, president of Dillard University. And I'm going to be turning things over to Laura Ibsen, who is the president and CEO of Lucian. Uh, who will be moderating this uh, conversation. We're really excited. So here for a panel on the unique challenges facing HBCUs and new models to successfully meet the needs of today's learner, please welcome our panel. Okay, here we go. Dr. Thomas, wonderful to see you. Welcome. You're on Thank the you, great to be here. Great, you're on the big screen, so you gotta keep smiling. And uh, I know that many people are, we have some vacancies because of flight cancellations, spring break, uh, everything else. So thank you again for joining us. Um, so let's get started. And before I do, I just wanted, for those of you that might not know Elucian, we're an ed tech company providing platform and solutions to over 27 higher education institutions around the world, serving 26 million students, and really proud to serve 70 of the 101 HBCUs uh, in such a transformational time. And I'm really thrilled to be here with these three amazing presidents from the HBCUs. Um, they're here to share the current landscape around uh, leading through change, this unique moment in time, what's happened around areas of social injustice, and what's next. Now, one of the things I did was I looked at some of the data. It's really amazing when you think about the impact that the HBCUs have. While they represent 3% of all higher education institutions in the US, they produce nearly 20% of African-American college students. Now, there's more impact. A recent study by the Alabama State University found that HBCUs graduate 40% of black engineers, 40% of black Congress members, 50% of black lawyers, 50% of black doctors, and 80% of black judges. And when you think about the impact of that, the ecosystem, the role models, it's really powerful to have you here today to talk about what's next. Their impact is enormous, and while they led in amazing ways through COVID, uh, you know, managing through inequities in the changing landscape of students, they're finding new opportunities. And what we wanted to uncover today is what do those opportunities look like? How are they leading? How can we learn from the HBCUs and do a better job of supporting them as well? So welcome again. And I know that we, we already um, introduced these amazing panelists, but I couldn't help myself. The accomplishments that they've all had are, are astounding. And I want to first introduce you to Michael Sorrell, He's the president of Paul Quinn College, which you heard in Dallas, Texas. In his 14 years of leadership, Paul Quinn has become a leading example for his efforts to remake higher education, focusing on under-resourced students and communities. President Sorrell is one of the most decorated college presidents. He has a big, powerful voice, which I know many of you have heard, which is just spectacular. He was named Higher Education's President of the Year of educa by Education Dive, one of the world's 50 greatest leaders for, by Fortune Magazine. Uh, and, and only three, the only three-time recipient of the HBCU Male President of the Year Award. Thank you for being here, Michael. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, now to you, Dr. Thomas. I'll try to shorten it up because I want to get to the conversation, but you have a long list. Uh, President? My, 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 mine is shorter than um, <laughs> President Sorrell's. It, okay, well, I, I'm not comparing, but there you go. Um, well, you joined Morehouse in 2018, correct? Uh, you're in Atlanta. I hope your weather's nice there. It's pretty nice here as well. And you're quite a transformational leader. You launched Morehouse's first online program, and when we talked, you did that in record time. You've been at the center of intellectual discourse and social engagement. And since you've joined Morehouse, you've, you've led in generating more than 200 million in fundraising experts, uh, efforts, and that's going a long way. You're an award-winning author, contemporary thought leader in organizational management. Georgia Trend named you one of the most, 100 most influential Georgians. Savoy Magazine uh, named you one of the most influential black corporate directors. 
Uh, the lists go on and on, but welcome. Welcome, David. Thank you for joining us via Zoom. Finally, Thank you. Wonderful. And finally, Dr. Walter Kimbrough. Uh, Dr. Kimbrough is president of Dillard University, as you all know, in New Orleans. Um, you did amazing things to come back from Hurricane Katrina, by the way. And um, you've done a spectacular job in enrollment, fundraising. You've improved enrollment by 10 points, uh, graduation by, by more than 20%, making a difference every day. You're a recognized leader. My favorite um, uh, accolade of yours is one of the 20 most interesting college presidents by the best schools.org. Uh, many others named HBCU Male President of the Year by HBCU Digest. Thank you for joining us, Walter. Thank and you. And we're going to get started. So I had to tell a story because in preparation of this panel, um, I made a statement because I grew up in Silicon Valley and worked at a company called Cisco and I worked for an amazing CEO who, his passion was education, his name is John Chambers. And he always said, Laura, education is the great equalizer in life. So what did I do? I started off my conversation with Michael and Walter with, hey, I wanna talk about the, that education is a great equalizer in life and how we make sure all this happens. And um, Michael, I'm gonna turn it over to you because you, um, you push back. Tell us a little bit about, you know, when we think about education as a great equalizer, why isn't that happening for everyone and what do we need to do? Yeah, I would tell you that education has the potential to be the great equalizer, but it is falling short because everyone doesn't receive the same type of education. And even if they did, they don't get to that education in the same way. So, for example, if you are a student who works three jobs to be able to afford to go to school, your experience is going to be radically different from the student that doesn't even have to do work study. Right? That student's going to have different time. They're going to be able to engage with the experience differently. Now, you may both have the same degree from the institution, but you will not have both had the same educational experience. On top of that, when you look at different types of schools in the ecosystem of higher education, those schools are providing differences. So if we want an equitable outcome for education, then we have to address the moments that lead up to students sitting in the classroom, but we also have to acknowledge that even the classrooms they're sitting in isn't gonna produce the same result. So I get the theory behind it. I think it's a wonderful theory, I think it's a theory that, you know, just doesn't hold up. So, so David, you had a little bit different take on this concept of education as a great equalizer in life. Share a few of your perspectives. So, um, the way I would think about it is that um, education is the great elevator up. Um, that it doesn't guarantee to what I think is uh, President Sorrell's point that everybody has the same starting line, but it does have the capacity to move everyone beyond, if you will, the linear projection of their starting point. That is assuming that they're not from privileged backgrounds. And so we say it's the great equalizer as if that means everybody's gonna wind up at the same end point. Um, but I think it is the great elevator up. And um, I think that there are ways in which if we, and I think historically black colleges and universities have done a great job of this, which is realizing the starting point of our students and accelerating, if you will, right, that linear trajectory for them so that where they wind up is well beyond what we would predict. And, you know, one piece of data of that for historically black colleges and universities is that um, we are much better at moving individuals from the last quarter quartile uh, in terms of wealth or wealth family income to sustainable middle class uh, jobs uh, that support families in the 
uh, top two quartiles. Then for students who, black students who went to predominantly white institutions. So, you know, I think the, the term equalizer throws folks off, but I think it is the great elevator up. Thank you. And um, Dr. Kilbro, when we, when we talked about uh, this concept of the elevator and the lift, and I think you were speaking about that as well, right now so many of our institutions are looking at how do we put students at the center at a time where they went through COVID, they were online, 160 million students online. You've had so many creative approaches at Dildred University. Talk a little bit about how do you differentiate and build uh, a model for students at the center and, and the lift that you have to have and that you also have at Paul Quinn because you receive students that, uh, that you, you told me, 9 to 10% there and the lift that you have to do is enormous. So I'll turn it to you. Right, so I think one of the, the challenges that we miss when we talk about historically black colleges and universities as a sector, about 70% of all of our students are Pell Grant eligible, which means they come from families that earn roughly less than $40,000 a year. Now nationally for all college students, it's only about 35%. So we're double that national average. Um, there was a study done out of Penn recently about, or out of Temple in terms of um, needs in terms of unmet needs for housing insecurity and food insecurity that we participated. I think Paul Quinn participated. Mm -hmm. And when I share that data with our faculty, staff, and board members, even at a place like Dillard, you can have 50 or 60% of our students during a pandemic saying, I had food insecurity. I had housing insecurity. One of the reasons we had students who stayed on campus throughout the pandemic, some are just like, I'm safer in New Orleans than at home in Chicago in we both have Chicago roots. Yeah, I was like, ooh. Right. You know? <laughs> I'm safer in the pandemic because part of that is not just in terms of issues of crime because we have it in New Orleans too, but it was having a place to stay and having guaranteed meals. And so providing all those things, people don't think about that as much when they think about a student goes to college and your parents kick in and they do all these other things. We have a different level of calculus in terms of what we have to do because we're not only dealing with the challenges of educating those students, you're dealing with all the other services and wraparound services that I think that we've had to really lean into and find partners to help us to do that better because that's who's coming to colleges and universities. There are more and more people who are coming with more and more of those needs. And so as, as Tom Friedman mentioned, how do we create these sort of collaborative, uh, adaptive partnerships to address these issues? And I think that's a point that we can't let go of. And let me, let me just say this. I, I think there's a fundamental problem that people are fascinated by institutions who put students at the center of what they do. I thought that's what college was supposed to do, right? Like our students are coming to us trusting us to educate them, to see them, to understand them. There should be nothing novel about making decisions with their best interest at heart. And the part that fascinates me the most is HBCUs are absolutely the starting point for wraparound services, right? But no one wants to give us credit for that, right? Like historically, we were founded to be a place that took four million formerly enslaved people and lift them into the American way of life. People who were never intended to be included in that. And so we, we did, the students didn't have tuition, they didn't have land, they didn't have, they didn't have any of this. So everything had to be provided. That's where it starts. I just don't know how taking care of your customer makes you special. Like that makes you, the people who don't take care of their customers shouldn't be in this business. So I'm curious, absolutely. <laughs> Dr. Thomas and Dr. Kilbro, I'll turn it to you. What gets in the way of putting students at the center then? And I'd love to hear some of the creative uh, capabilities that you have around wraparound services that more institutions can learn from because you're truly at the core of providing those services. Yeah, so, um, you know, there, 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 are, there, are, there are a number of things that get in the way. And, and you know, I would point out that um, 
the diversity among historically black colleges is as broad as the diversity among all institutions in higher education. Uh, but, uh, you know, things get in the way. So um, we at Morehouse, at least half of my students get into a, a top 50 um, liberal arts college or major state university and we have to compete with them. Uh, and when you go to many of those places, they look like country clubs because those schools can afford because of their endowments or their state funding uh, to make a different level of investment in their physical infrastructure than quite frankly, you will find at Morehouse College. Even though I would argue that we stand toe to toe with any university in the country in terms of what our students our alumni have gone on to do professionally and more importantly uh, for the country. You can be pulled off of putting students first if you're playing the game of rankings and that's true for all schools. Uh, you can also be pulled away from it by not realizing that the needs of our students are changing and uh, the student is coming to college today, especially after this pandemic, uh, in many ways has a set of needs and experiences that if, if we're not focused on them and putting them first, we will essentially miss the student. And what we've tried to do here at Morehouse is really, um, recommit ourselves to making decisions that put our students first and being clear that our students are scholars first. So our athletes are not athletes first, they're scholars first. Um, and having high expectations for all of our students uh, and really listening and learning and investing um, our scarce resources in that student experience and aligning the incentives of our institution for our staff and faculty to really be focused on uh, students first. And, and the last thing is figuring out where our students are. Uh, and, and one of the things about the pandemic is I think we've become much better at using technology to capture our students where they are so that we can bring them to where we want them to be by the time they cross the finish line at Morehouse for graduation. Awesome. Dr. Sorrell, you're also not just putting students first, but family first and a new program to enroll family members. I thought it would be powerful to share a few thoughts around how do you build community around education when all of the institutions are competing for enrollment and students, and what's your differentiator? So, you know, all of our innovations at Paul Quinn come from having asked our students, how are they, right? Like, what's important to you? How are you doing? Um, and then listening when they tell us. Um, one of the things, though, that I've never thought made any sense is we expect first-generation college students and Pell Grant students to be superheroes, right? We ask them to do the most of any set of college students. We don't ask affluent students to go out and make enough money to lift all of their families into another level of affluency, right? We don't ask middle-class students to save their families, but we ask first-generation college students and Pell Grant students to hold the dreams of everyone around them in their community, in their family, all of them. And that just seems horribly unfair. And then when those students suffer and stumble and maybe break down under that pressure, then we judge them harshly. So what we've decided to do is create a program called the Village Program. And it works very, very simply. If you are a Pell Grant student with a 3.0 or better, you are automatically admitted to Paul Quinn 
but you get to bring two of your family members and or friends with you. And so the idea is, no, thank you. The idea is you bring your village with you and you get a, you, you build a team. Because instead of asking one person to lift everyone out of poverty or help everyone's trajectory change, let's do three people, right? Let's create depth in your family relationships, in your, in your community, and, and touch more people that way. And, you know, we are very, very excited about it. Um, it's amazing to see the students' response, but it's also amazing to see their families' responses because it's saying to some of them for the first time, we believe in you too. And look, everyone needs someone else to believe in them. Absolutely, thank you. Dr. Kimbrough, you are involved with the Transformation Project, so is Dr. Thomas. It's a collaboration between Thurgood Marshall College Fund, the United Negro College Fund, and the Partnership for Education Advancement, looking for new opportunities to innovate and have impact on the community. Could you share a little bit more with the audience around what that program will do, how does it impact Dillard University, and uh, stretch across the HBCUs and beyond? Well, I, I think like any other sector, and it, part of our conversation today, we're all looking to figure out how do we get more out of the resources that we have, and how do we bring more people into the conversation that are going to move these students and families forward, as, as Michael just talked about. So as a part of programs like the Transformation Project and other programs like that, we're trying to figure out how do we maximize the resources that we have and do a better job with what we have to move students further. Now, part of the conversation still has to be, we still, and I've heard this for years, HBCUs, you know, we do, you know, the most with little. And that's got to change. We can cite all the statistics about how great we're doing. And, and at some point in time, we have to have the conversation to say, how can this sector keep pro producing like this and we give them nothing to work with? What if we really made an investment? So I think we're really trying to get into the investment mode. I mean, you've seen some of that in the last couple of years since the pandemic began, but part of what needs to happen as a part of the transformation is that we need to have a radical change in ideology about how do we invest in this small subset of institutions that continuously performs above any others when you really start to dig in. And there are more and more studies that are coming out to say HBCUs are doing a better job here and here and here. So it's not just a saying we think we're great. There's data now that supports that. So I think as a part of projects like a transformation project, people are trying to say, how do we take these resources and invest them? But we need to get much more of an investment. So that's I'm spending a lot of time talking about that. Just the, the data is there. And we've got to really make real investments if we're really going, if we want to get to the place where education can be an equalizer instead of a lift so that you're, you know, you're at the bottom, you're just a little bit higher than everybody else because everybody else is lifted too. Um, we've got to figure out a way to do some of that. So that's a part of that kind of work that we're going to be involved in. So how else do we shake it up? Well, you know, for me, I, I think we've got to be really bold and we've got to push some buttons and say things that make people, we've got to have those uncomfortable conversations. And we've got to just, sometimes we can't be nice <laughs> about some of those things and just say, this is, this is a situation. This is what's going on in this country. Once again, we talk about this great equalizer. And I'm thinking about those kids in Louisiana when, you know, the pandemic hit. And I think uh, President Thomas talked about this. We don't know what's going to be coming to our campus in the next couple of years, because I know several parish school districts in Louisiana that when that pandemic hit in March, they shut down for the year. They didn't do anything else. I had one alum I saw at a gas station saying, we're making packets. We're printing packets to take to families so they could complete work. Because I know the technology is great, but 27% of families in Louisiana don't have broadband, broadband internet access. So all the technology doesn't matter if you, you got to go sit outside the McDonald's parking lot and then hope you have a laptop that works. Because that's one of the things we found out during the pandemic. We had students who were just like, my laptop died. Those are the kinds of things that we're dealing with. So we've got to really just start to, you know, say, this is where the investments go. And these are the places that can use those investments to do the kind of work that we're going to do as this society becomes, you know, particularly in this country, as we become more and more diverse. And this becomes a predominant group that enters higher education. We've got to make more investments. And we're just we're not doing that yet. So share some other thoughts. I mean, we've talked for decades around the digital divide. We're done broadband technology. The administration's focused on it. Yet 
we still don't have access. And many of the communities without, without access are communities that are um, underserved, have social issues, uh, we haven't reached them. What else do we need to do to change that? And, and as we went through COVID, there was a lot of efforts, but have we fallen back on that again? I mean, listen, here's what I think about this. We have to actually address the biggest problem in the room. And the biggest problem in the room is poverty. Over 45 million Americans live in poverty. The majority of students coming out of public K through 12 education in this country are coming from low income and poverty level backgrounds. That means that the American educational system is now defined by poverty. Until we understand what that means, right? It means you are robbed of the ability to do simple things simply, right? Everything is a struggle. The trauma involved with that has to be spoken to. It has to be addressed. And we keep putting Band-Aids on fissures. If we don't really reach in and deal with that, I mean, we talk about the issues with not having broadband, with not having, I mean, listen, we sent laptops home. We sent Wi-Fi home. But if you can't afford to pay your electricity bill, it doesn't matter. We're going to have to speak to these issues in a very concrete way, in a very earnest way, in a very consistent way. And, you know, Dave is absolutely right. There, the diversity in HBCUs is significant, right? but all of them are ministering to communities that start out in places where students are struggling and their families are struggling. But that's not just an HBCU issue, right? That's now an American issue. And no amount of pretending, no amount of fantasizing is gonna change that if we don't engage directly and change it. So it's a, it is a chicken and egg, and if anyone caught Dr. LeBanks session on students first, one of the things he talked about is when you have poverty, most of those, most people and the jobs they have don't give them the freedom of managing their time. And if you don't have time to get an education, then we're not going to get to the great equalizer. Dr. Thomas, I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts on this, and we've got a few more minutes before we wrap up, but you're right. It's, it starts with do they have money to go to school, and they can, can they have a great life? You, you talked about that. Dr. Thomas. Yeah, you know, I, it, it, you know, you, you you use the term, you know, it's a chicken and the uh, a chicken or the egg issue, and you know, when I listen to Michael talk, and I totally agree with him, um, it is the chicken, and what we've been great at at take is taking the eggs that the chicken laid and doing with them more than one might have anticipated. But, and the chicken is the society that gives us the raw human material uh, that we call our students uh, to work with. Uh, but, what, but to Michael's point, um, the big issue in our society, and it has to be solved at the level of, of national policy is the reality that increasingly the students who should be populating our colleges are coming from low income, under resourced families. And given the wealth gap that is widening in our country, even people who three decades ago rightfully thought of themselves as middle class when it comes to affording a high quality education at the sticker price, most cannot afford it. Uh, and in the African American community, uh, we know that less, fewer than 3% of black families could afford to pay the full sticker price of a Morehouse College education. Um, and, um, uh, that comes back to this issue, not just of poverty, but of income inequality, and it accounts for a lot. Um, and uh, that's, that's the elephant in the room. And I think the question 
too. There's a question here for uh, leaders of historically black colleges. I think in many ways, we've stayed out of that conversation about national policy and state government policy. And a question for us as we think about, um, you know, uh, the transformation project is, is there an agenda that we need to work as leaders of these institutions um, and as respected voices in our communities? Well, I'd, I'd like to wrap with what is the, you know, the one thing that we can work on to change that, uh, the collaboration with HBCUs and having a voice. What would you like to see change across the board to impact the ability for students to have access and achieve amazing things at the HBCUs? Dr. Kimbrough. I'll just say quickly, we've got to have true partners that want to help address all the issues. I mean, I agree. I think the income and wealth inequality is really huge. And so what are people going to help us do to make sure we mitigate that so people have access to education? Because I think it's going to be a growing issue. So once again, going back to Friedman, those complex adaptive coalitions, we have to be a part of that coalition. How about philanthropy? Oh, philanthropy is going to be key, but it's starting to give to the people who are really doing the heavy lifts and stop celebrating every time Abs Harvard gets another $400 million. And people are like, oh, that's so great. I, no, it's not. It's horrible. Absolutely. It's horrible. That's <laughs> Thank you. Michael. Yeah, amen. All right. I mean, look, people have to invest in ways that produce the real return. And to Walter's point, how many times are we going to praise people for doing the absolute easiest thing they could do with their money? Right? And then we want to hold them up as if they are amazing. You're not amazing. Right? You didn't do the one amazing thing you did, maybe, maybe you earned all that money yourself, but chances are you were on third base and you scored. Right? So maybe if you want to be amazing, do something amazing. Invest in a set of schools that are doing incredible work and, and, and let them do more incredible work. But I'm, I'm just time out for praising people for doing the easiest thing available to them. Thank you. Not you all have websites where we can contribute to. Yes. Dr. Thomas, I'd like to give you on Zoom the last word before we close. Any well, thoughts? In my uh, almost 40 years of being uh, in this uh, industry of higher education, I've learned one lesson. Um, you should not spend a lot of time trying to improve on perfection. And uh, I think my two colleagues here have perfectly summed up the answer <laughs> to your question. So I'm not going to add anything to it. I'm just going to say ditto. Here, here, here. Let's all do something amazing. Thank you so much for joining us for this panel of these marvelous presidents and the HBCUs leading the way. Thank you so much. Thank you.